Sanders, and I'm the youth director here at Bluff Park. Um, and welcome to Discovery Weekend. So whether you know it or not, whether you've been here since Friday night or joined us for our candlelight service last night, or you didn't realize that a bunch of middle and high schoolers would be taking over your worship service this morning, we're really glad that you're here. God has been meeting us and moving among us this weekend, and I believe that God isn't done and that there's more for us to hear and receive from God today. But before we get into that, I want to give you all a little glimpse of where we've been. Um, if you've been here all weekend, this will be a quick summary um, of what we've been hearing already. I do want to let you all know that today has not looked exactly like I planned it. Um, and by that, I mean that this is not the outfit that I planned to wear today. I thought it was gonna be great for all of my students to wear their special matching Discovery t-shirts, and that was gonna be good and cool for them, and it was gonna be so sweet, but I was like, this is my first time preaching in the gathering, and I wanna wear something cute and something special so they can all wear their t-shirts. I'll wear something nice. And then last night, we pied the seniors with whipped cream pies. Um, the team that won our weekend-long competition, the middle schoolers got to pie the seniors. Um, with pies full of whipped cream, and there were extra cans of whipped cream sitting out from making the pies. And I feel like you guys can probably do the math. A lot of whipped cream went everywhere, and everywhere included me. Um, my hair was full of it. I had a pocket full of it, um, the pocket with my phone in it, actually. Um, I was just coated. Um, my clothes are not ruined, but they do smell like rotten sugar milk. Um, so my outfit for today, which included those jeans, um, got to change a little bit. So now I do get to match with the rest of my students, which is probably how it should have been in the first place. And all that to say, however you ended up here, whether you had a very special outfit plan that you did not get to wear, or whether you're wearing the same t-shirt as literally everyone else your age, I'm glad that you're here. Um... It's been a really great weekend. We started on Friday night. Miss Kate Ryan started us off talking about um, humility in Christ. Um, and then Miss Caroline walked us through um, how there are so many differences between us and we're all unique and we're all special. Um, but Jesus is the thing that unites us. Jesus is more important than any of the things um, that separate us or that would divide us. And then Johnny pulled in with not only are we all different and all made unique, um, but we're all parts of the same body and we all have an important role to play in God's work and in the body of Christ. And then last night, Will came in with what it looks like to live together as Christians at our candlelight service and that basically what it means to live together as Christians is to love one another as God loved us. Um, so that's where we've been this weekend. I'm going to back us up a little bit um, because... This year's Discovery Weekend is actually the third year in a three-year curriculum of discoveries. So year one was Discover You, which was all about discovering our individual identities in Christ. And year two was Discover Him, which was all about discovering the character of God and who God is and what God is like. Um, and then this year has been Discover Us. And Discover Us um, is a little bit different. Because now we know who God is, and we know who we are as individuals, but if that's all we needed to know, then we probably wouldn't be here. If that's all our faith encompassed, we wouldn't really have church services, or retreats, or Bible studies, or small groups, would we? If following Christ was all about just me and my relationship with God, I could sit in my room all day, every day, just praying and reading my Bible and singing along to worship music on Spotify, and everything would be fine and dandy. And there are times in scripture where we see people following God alone. It's possible, but those times are not the majority. Instead, what we see over and over again in scripture is God calling us to follow him together. It's right at the core of what Jesus calls the greatest commandment in Mark 12. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So right at the very core of our faith is the commandment, the calling, to love one another. And what are we going to have to do if we're going to love one another? Unfortunately, we will have to spend some time together. 
It's not unfortunate, actually. It's one of the greatest gifts that God gives us in this life, that we don't have to live alone. Not only are we given the presence of God through the Holy Spirit to walk with us every moment of every day, but God comes to us and speaks to us and cares for us through one another. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, this is also one of the most difficult parts of life and one of the most challenging parts of being a Christian. Other people are wonderful. They're smart and funny and kind and interesting and encouraging and just the best. And they're frustrating and mean and sometimes selfish and careless, just like us. And we've got to love them? It's not the easiest calling. It isn't for us today, and it wasn't for the earliest followers of Jesus, the first groups of people who figured out what it means to be Christians together, to be a church. It's something they had to figure out really early on. How are we going to do this? How the heck are we going to do this? How are we going to love each other like Jesus has called us to do? How are we going to live together and follow Jesus together and put up with each other? Do you want to know what the good news is? They wrote it down. Thank goodness. So we aren't just starting from scratch. When we wonder what it looks like to follow Jesus, not just alone in our rooms or in our cars or on a nice nature walk with no one else around, but in the everyday with people alongside us, people who are frustrating or annoying or who get in our way or who bother us or who chew gum while they're talking. We don't have to make it up as we go. We have what the Apostle Paul calls a great cloud of witnesses, the people who have gone before us, who tripped and stumbled along as they learned to follow Christ together. We get to learn from their mistakes and their victories as we make our own. So that's what this weekend has been about. We've been looking at the earliest days of the church, from Galatians to 1 Corinthians to Philippians to Colossians. I think that those are in chronological order, if you're curious. Otherwise, Google led me astray. To see how some of the very first Christians learned what it means and what it looks like to be the church. And through it all, we've been looking at this one verse that kind of sums up the days of some of the very first people to follow Jesus. It's found in the book of Acts, which is kind of the story of what happened right after everything we read in the Gospels. When Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried, the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We just said that. Then what? Then what is the book of Acts? And in Acts chapter 2, we find the passage that has guided us throughout this weekend and before from when we first started putting this weekend together. It's a glimpse of what the very first churches looked like. Let's read it together. It should be on a slide. It is. Okay. So it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. We've read that before every service. But there's more. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. How does that sound to you guys? Weird? Beautiful? Uncomfortable? Does it sound like the kind of church you're familiar with? That's not just a question I ask because it's a fun thought experiment. It's a question I ask because I believe those verses aren't just a part of our history as Christians. I believe they're a picture not just of what the church looked like 2,000 years ago, but of what the church is meant to look like today. Now, some of you might not have been in church much, and maybe you're not super interested in this. I get that. And maybe some of you haven't spent much time in church, but the time you have spent in church hasn't looked like this. And maybe you grew up in a church just like this, like Nathan. So when you hear these verses, it sounds like home. It sounds like what you're familiar with. It sounds like what you've experienced of church and of Christians and of God. No matter where you're coming from, this sermon is for you, I promise. So what I really want to do today is look at what it's meant to look like when we follow Jesus together. For some of you who've been in church your whole lives, that'll be a reminder. And for some of you, it might be the first time you're hearing what church and church people are meant to be like. And I do want to offer a disclaimer that we don't always get it right. That's a nice way of putting it. And we're never going to get it perfect. But as we follow God together and grow closer to God together, this is what we're moving towards. This is how we hope to live. 
Now, I hope it's okay with you guys. I want to share a little bit of my story because my story of meeting and knowing and following God is actually really closely tied to these specific verses from Acts. I probably heard these verses for the first time long before I was old enough to understand them, which is saying something because I was a very early talker. It was probably before I could walk, which was after I could talk because I said hi to everyone in the grocery store as a nine-month-old. Um, my mother will tell you that she had to walk up to people and tell them that I would stop shouting hi at them if they would just say hi back to me, um, but that I would not stop shouting hi at them progressively louder and louder until they would respond. Um, so I guess she met a lot of people at Bruno's that way. Um. So anyway, I probably heard these verses long before I was shouting at people in Bruno's, um, trying to greet them enthusiastically. Because um, when I was a baby, my family helped start a church, and that church was founded on this same passage that we've been talking about all weekend. It was the verse they chose to represent what they wanted the new church to look like. We read it all the time. We talked about it all the time. We had it painted on walls. I would sit under the walls and like trace the letters with my fingers when I was a kid, when I was really bored because my parents were working. It was a core part of everything we did. It shaped the whole church. I literally cannot tell you how many times I must have heard or read these verses by the time I was in high school. Because my family stayed deeply involved in that church. My mom, my aunt, and my uncle all worked there. My sister and cousins and I were sort of raised there. We knew all the best hiding spots in the building for hide and seek, every fridge where you could look for snacks, every couch in someone's office where you could sneak off for a nap. All our best friends were the kids of other people on staff at the church. And we were surrounded from our very earliest days by hundreds of people, hundreds, who loved us, cared for us, and encouraged us. That church was our home. And in many ways, it looked just like the passage that it was inspired by in Acts. We were devoted to growing in our faith, just like those verses talked about. We spent hours listening to sermons and taking notes and reading the Bible together and trying to grow closer to God, just like what's happening in those verses. We ate together and prayed together constantly. Miraculous things did happen, things that I still can't explain to this day. We did share with one another and take care of each other. The church would pitch in and raise money to buy a car for a family that couldn't afford one. We were always ready to support someone who needed help, whether what they needed was money or food or a place to stay or just someone to listen to their story. During one of the hardest times of my life, when I was a sophomore in high school, a friend's family, folks who went to church with us, took my sister, in, took my sister and I in for a week and let us stay with them, no questions asked. This church raised me, and it taught me what these verses from Acts mean. But that church was also really broken. There was a lot that went on there that wasn't good and wasn't healthy and didn't look anything like the verses, the church that these verses describe. In fact, a lot of it didn't look anything like Jesus at all. Leaders in the church, some of them started taking advantage of people and treating them badly and leaving them tired and burnt out on church and Jesus as a whole. The church started to revolve less and less around God and more and more around the people in charge. It got really ugly and really harmful, and eventually the whole place basically fell apart. And guys, it changed my whole perspective of church. I still loved God. And I still loved people, but I was not so sure about church anymore. I had seen a church that looked perfect, that had been modeled off exactly what we see in the Bible, exactly what we've seen in these verses. And I had seen it turn dark and harmful and hurtful. It was a big church, so I had seen thousands of people, including my family, get really deeply hurt. It was awful. Church had always been a place that felt safe for me, but it didn't anymore. Now it felt risky and dangerous. I wasn't sure what I, I wasn't sure that I believed like that churches like the one in Acts 2 existed anymore. Because, you know, I thought I had one. But it hurt a lot of people and then it fell apart. How was I supposed to trust that the same thing wouldn't happen again? How was I going to believe that churches like Acts 2 really exist anymore? Well, I'm here. And not only am I here in a church, but I work here. So clearly something happened, and that thing is really and truly God. 
God and people who loved me and loved God too. It was people who treated me with kindness and gentleness, with patience and compassion and love, who reminded me that that is what God looks like and that that is what churches, Christians, the people who follow God are meant to look like. And it was God reminding me how loved I am, how valued I am, and gently asking me, will you share that love with other people? Will you help them see who I am and how much I love them? And that's what I want to do, always. It's what I feel called to do. It's why I'm here. And it's what I believe we're all called to do if we want to be followers of Jesus. For you, it might not look like being a youth director, and that's fine. I did not think it would look like that for me either. Here I am. But what we see in Acts 2 is pretty simple. It's people who are loved by God, who know that they are loved by God, and who are sharing that love with everyone they meet. It's what they were called to do 2,000 years ago, and it's the same thing we are called to do today. What I want most of all for you to take away from this message, from this weekend, if you remember nothing else, nothing that anybody said, no games that we played, I don't know how you could forget giant volleyball, especially if you popped your shoulder out of socket or bruised your tailbone. Um, I don't know how you could forget the nail polish relay, I hope that you have many good memories of this weekend. I hope you've had a blast. But if somehow you forget everything else, but if you remember this one thing, I want you to remember something super simple. I want you to know that God loves you. That's the most important thing that I will ever tell you. The most important thing I could ever tell you. And it always will be. If you never remember anything else I ever say, that's okay with me. Now, if you can remember two things, I know that's a big step up, but if you can remember that God loves you, start there. If you think you've got two memories in you, here's what I help you take away from this weekend. God loves you, and God wants us to love each other. That's what Acts 2 boils down to. That's what it's saying. And that's really what all the verses that we've read all weekend boil down to. It's what's at the heart of every Bible passage that we've read all weekend. It's what's at the heart of the whole Bible. God loves us, and God wants us to love each other. When the early Christians ate together, prayed together, worshipped together, shared with one another, and sold their possessions so they could provide for one another, what were they doing? They were sharing the love of God with one another. When God tells us to value one another, to share what we have with one another, to be patient with one another and make sacrifices for one another, to be kind to one another, what is God telling us to do? What does all of that add up to? Loving one another. When God called a bunch of people to start a church when I was just a baby, a church where I would grow and learn and be deeply loved and hurt, what was God calling them to do? God was calling them to love each other. When God called a bunch of people to start this church, long before most of us were born, some of us were around, what was God calling them to do? God was calling them to love each other. Do we always do it perfectly? Nope. Definitely not. We get hurt, and we hurt each other, and we forget the love of God that changes everything. But always, 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 we are loved by God. And always, 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 we can choose again to love one another. We won't always like each other, and we won't always feel lots of warm, happy feelings about each other, but we can always share what we have. We can always choose patience and compassion. We can always be gentle and humble. And every time we do, we show the world what the church is meant to be, and we show the world what God is like. When we are generous and patient and compassionate and gentle and humble, we show the world that God is generous and patient and compassionate and gentle and humble. Like Jesus says in John 13, the way the world will know that we are followers of Jesus is if we love each other. That's what this weekend is all about. Once we've discovered ourselves and once we've discovered who God is, once we know that the most important thing about us is how deeply loved we are by God, it's time to love other people the same way. That's what it means to discover us. That's what it means to follow Jesus together. It means we are loved by God, we love God, 
and we love one another. Hey friends, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you for tuning into our message this week in the gathering. We hope you found it meaningful and life-giving. As always, you're invited to join us for worship on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., either in person here in the chapel or online. If you want to know more about who we are at Bluff Park United Methodist Church, you're invited to check out our website. There you'll find out who we are, what we have going on, and how you can be a part of it. As always, friends, if there's anything that we can do for you, you're invited to reach out to us. We are here to help you and support you in any way that we can. We hope that you're having a great week, and we look forward to seeing you soon.